Theater presents. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Look up into the night sky at the pattern of the stars. Night by night, as our whirling planet moves through its orbit, the pattern changes slightly. The stars themselves remain constant, locked in the master's design, the mosaic fixed, except for an occasional shooting star or... Wait a minute. What is that streak of pulsing fire that blazes across, dies, whirls, hurtles earthward, faster than any plane could move? An illusion? A mirage or a reality? The link between us and other worlds beyond our galaxy? Whatever it is, we call it a UFO, an unidentified flying object. Concentrate on the spinning disk in front of you, Lisa. All right, Doc. I'm concentrating. There's a star at the top, a circle at the bottom. Yes. Now watch the symbols as they turn. Watch. Watch. Let the wheel space you out, soothe you, call you. Are you there? Are you there? Our mystery drama... A Stranger Among Us was based on the documented story of Lisa X from the files of Bryce Bond and adapted for Mystery Theater by Ian Martin. It stars Marion Seldes. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. There are really only two schools of thought about the UFO, the scoffers and the believers. Does the mystery craft from a galaxy beyond our comprehension roam our skies? Or are all the reported sightings so much self-delusion by hysterics and romantics? I hasten to say I take no side. Recently, there have come into my hands some carefully documented files on this subject. A story so fantastic and out of this world that I felt I must share it with you. A story that is actual and real. Only the names have been changed to protect the protagonist's rights to privacy. Dr. Bryce Dunlop. Hi, Doc. Detective Sergeant O'Banion here. Hey, Dave, how's it going? Oh, can you complain too much, Bryce? Long time no see. <laughs> or here. No bats or squirrels running around your belfry these days. Oh, the usual compliment every time the moon gets full. Nothing white enough out to catch your fancy. Except, like, right now. Right now? Yeah. Have I got a case for you? And, um, brother, do I need your help? Well, you got it before you even asked. You think maybe you could track over here to the precinct house? It's that immediate? And that important? Immediate, yeah. Important? Well, that's what you got to tell me. I want you to meet a lady who's got me way out of my depth. I don't know whether to charge her, commit her, or just try to forget I ever ran into her. I promise you, she's clear out of this world. I'm sort of a member. Oh, I have the degrees. B.S. from Princeton, M.A. from Duke University, 
and my Ph.D. from Berkeley. My major, of course, is psychology, which is what I practice. But my minor, and now an all-absorbing hobby, is parapsychology. And in particular, a very special branch of it. SEEP, which is an acronym for the Societies to Examine Extraterrestrial Phenomena. A hobby I mention only because, although I didn't know it at the time, I was about to receive one of the most highly documented reports on a UFO that ever came to our files. A story so bizarre and chilling that it staggers the mind. Bryce, let me fill you in. About an hour ago, around 11 o'clock this morning, this babe walked into the squad room. She wanted to see the lieutenant, but like you know, he's had the flu and I've been covering for him. So we went into the lieutenant's office and, uh, well now... She's a, a tall girl, statuesque, kind of beautiful, poised, well-to-do. I mean, you know, good clothes, expensive clothes, perfume, all that. Uh, she speaks well. She looks you right in the eyes and, uh, well, I mean, you'd never figure her for some kind of a nut or something. Except you do. I'm going to let you be the judge. Now, just listen to this story she gave me. Her name is Lisa Stallings. She's a widow with a couple of kids. She's a realtor. Pretty successful one. Right here in town. She's 33. Now, last night after dinner, she went to a church party, a kind of a social. She's pretty religious, I gather. And during the evening, this guy came up to her and asked her, Would you mind if I asked you to dance? No. Why should I? Well, you you are a bit taller than I am. That doesn't bother me. Maybe you're a better dancer than I am. My name is Terry Jessup. Well, I'm pleased to meet you. Mine's Lisa Stallings. Yes, I know. Lisa Stallings. Well, I guess I'm flattered. How did you know? Oh, I've been thoroughly briefed on you. Uh, shall we dance? Yes. Yes. Dance very well, Mr. Jessup. Nothing is left to chance. I beg your pardon? Well, I mean, they try to prepare you for every eventuality. My training was very thorough. Well, what business are you in, Mr. Jessup? I'm um, a coordinator. Now, if I understand, in what area of business? Oh, n- not in business. My work is more in the field of human relationships. May I ask you something? Of course. I'd like first to have your word that you won't repeat to anyone what I'm going to ask you. That sounds very mysterious and quite exciting. All right. Don't treat this lightly. I'm very serious. Do you believe in UFOs? (laughs) UFO? Mrs. Stallings. Well, you haven't answered me. Are, Are you all right? Yes. No, I mean... Oh, you just... You just freaked me out by what you asked me, you know? I know. No, you couldn't possibly. I mean, things you couldn't know that have happened to me lately and other things in my past you... You couldn't understand. Oh, but I do. You've actually seen a UFO, haven't you? And someone who came from one? How would you like to go right out now to a ship and meet these people face to face? Look, Mr. Jessup, I know you're just kidding around, so let's just drop this subject because I don't happen to think it's funny. Neither do I. Now we can get in my car and drive outside of town near Carmel to the ship. I'm not driving out of town in a car with you. We've only just met. Would I be here at a church social if there was anything (laughs) dangerous about me? Well... No, I suppose not. But I... I... (laughs) Are you really physically afraid of me? (laughs) You're bigger than I am. I think you have a complex about that. Not a complex in the world. I'm what I am, and you are what you are. And we happen to be special. We share a secret belief. And you could share so much more if you'd come with me. Share? What? Knowledge. Secret knowledge. 
proof of all you have believed so long and have had to keep hidden for fear of ridicule? I can lead you to your destiny. If it isn't me, it'll be somebody else. For you have been chosen. So she falls for this joker's line and she leaves with him in the car. And they drive out toward Carmel. And here's what... Now, wait a minute. I've given you the general picture. Let's go now and meet Mrs. Lisa Stallings and let her tell you the rest of her story for us. And all of a sudden, up ahead, I see this bright light flashing in the sky. Just up ahead of us, there was a wooded area with a lot of trees. And I said... Look at those lights zooming over the trees there. I see them. You think that's a UFO? I know it is. Looks as if it's landing. Yes, that's just what it's doing. Watch for the lights to disappear behind the trees. Yes, they're gone now. But I can still see the reflection. It's landed. They're waiting for us. I... I don't know if I want to go any nearer. Why not? I'm afraid... There's a tingling sensation running up and down my arm. I, I, can't, I, I can't breathe. I feel a being smothered. Move your arms up and down. You'll be all right. Are you cold? Well, no. I, I, I don't know. How can I be cold in the middle of the summer? Just rub your arms. They're waiting for you. They're going to them. Just keep your eyes on the flashing light. And do not be afraid. You are coming home. They are waiting. Waiting. The last thing I remember, then, was the flashing lights and rubbing my arms to keep them from going to sleep. The next thing I remembered was hours later, on another road far away. And I was driving the car back to town, and he... He was gone. I had this weird feeling that I was shrinking, and I was afraid, and I... I couldn't stop crying. So I just went home, and I somehow got to bed. When you woke up this morning, the first thing you did was drive the car down here to the station and report to us. Eh? Yes, it wasn't my car. I didn't know what had happened to Terry Jeff. You haven't heard from him since last night? No. And you didn't know that the car you brought to us here was a stolen car? No, I just thought it belonged to him. To Terry Jessup? Yeah. <clears throat> Mrs. Stallings, you still have no idea who Terry Jessup is? No, just a man I met at the dance. You have no idea what happened? Is it right now? No. And as of right now, I'd better be getting on home. I have lunch to prepare for two hungry kids. Well, uh, yeah, it isn't quite as easy as that, Mrs. Stallings. Uh, I got to decide what to do about you first. What do you mean? Well, we've apparently got a man missing under mysterious circumstances. We have a report of an illegal landing by some unidentified aircraft. And you drive in here with a stolen car. I didn't know it was stolen, Sergeant O'Banion. Well, she would scarcely have driven it in here if she had, Dave. Oh, thank you, Dr. Dunlap. Oh, now, the, the, don't misunderstand me, Mrs. Stallings. I, I'm ready to give you the benefit of the doubt, but I am a cop, so I have to go by the book. You weren't thinking of booking Mrs. Stallings, were you? No, but I do have to detain her. I need a full description of the missing man so I can get out an APB. And I'll need Mrs. Stallings to take me to the spot where she thought she saw this thing land. But then you'll have to give me a chance to make some arrangements. I have to see that my children are taken care of for this afternoon. Oh, sure, sure, of course. I'll send an officer with you. Uh, Dave, uh, since I serve in a semi-official capacity with the force, why don't you remand Mrs. Stallings in my custody? There are some questions I would like to ask her in any case. Oh, I'd be glad to answer anything I can. Well, as a matter of fact, I, I would be asking you to answer some for Dr. Dunlop anyway. I'd welcome being questioned by a psychiatrist. A psychologist, Mrs. Stallings? I'm not a medical doctor. Um, I wonder if, if before we leave, do you have a ladies' room in this building? <laughs> Even before women's live, Mrs. Stallings, 
If you'll just uh, go right across the squad room and out the door. Turn left. You'll find it down the hall, just past the elevator. I won't be long. Thank you, Sergeant. My pleasure. Uh, I'm surprised you're suddenly so trusting. I'm not. Detective Sims got the high sign and will suddenly find the same need. <laughs> you run co-ed washrooms? And Detective Sims' first name is Mary. Well, what do you think of Mrs. Stallings? I think she's a knockout. But is she also a freakout? Well, I don't know. Oh, I believe her about the car. The guy who was possibly just on the make. Uh, the rest... Well, don't leave it hanging. You notice when we spoke with her, this isn't the first experience she's had with a UFO. Well, I didn't go into that area. It's out of my field. Well, last night was different. Something screwy went on. First things first. Now, this lady is off bounds for both of us, Dave. She's a very special lady. With a lot of mind-blowing info to reveal. If she's ready to, or can find her memory. I can find that for her, if she gives me a chance. Yeah? How? The most modern technique we have to unlock the mind. Hypnotic regression. Through it, I'm sure we can have Lisa Stallings recall exactly what happened last night. Well, where do you stand so far? With Sergeant Dave O'Banion, who doubts the whole story? Or with Dr. Bryce Dunlap, the open mind, who wants to wait and see? Until all the evidence is in. No matter. Your opinion is your own. But the evidence has only begun. The mind-rocking story is still ahead of us. When I return shortly with Act Two. Backing out of the parking lot at the precinct house, Dr. Bryce Dunlap has surreptitiously been assessing Mrs. Stalling. And he has to admit he likes what he sees. She is less beautiful and striking. Her upper lip perhaps a trifle short, but the mouth full and generous, and the gray eyes large and lustrous. The eyebrows dusted by the feather of ash blonde hair that sweeps above them like bangs. And whatever his preoccupations, Hers are deeper, as she frowns slightly to herself. Hollis Drive, isn't it? Hmm? Oh, yes, right off Suncliff West. Oh, don't look so concerned. I don't think you're in any trouble. For the police, you mean? Well, well. Nora, Jimmy, healthy young animals like to eat on time. Oh, your children. Ah, there speaks a man with none. Or he wouldn't treat it so lightly. Oh, I hope I haven't. Not married? Once. I'm not working at it any longer. But it... Still gets your vote? Marriage? Yes. Well, why not? Well, some form of commitment anyway. That's nice. What happened to your husband? He was a POW at Vietnam. His name was released finally on a casualty list. What happened to me last night is more to the point. Can you answer that? Maybe. With this hypnosis thing? Yes. How soon can we try it? I'd have to ask a few questions first. I've spent most of the day answering them. What's a few more? Shoot. You've had some, well, some experiences with UFOs before. That's not a question. No. How could you know? Some things you said. The way you answered this Terry Jessup's questions. ESP. ESP. Extrasensory perception. Hobby of mine. More than that, actually. Uh, more than an avocation. More and more it's becoming my vocation. Ever hear of SEEP? the societies to examine extraterrestrial phenomena. You know about them? Yes. Some years ago when I was living in Florida, through a friend of mine, I met a doctor in a local chapter there. Because of my background, he wanted to put me through hypnosis. I was nervous about it, so I... I prayed for some kind of sign that it would be all right. And the day they tried, I... I got hysterical. And I was screaming very loudly... And all of a sudden, a tree outside the window broke in half and fell. I was screaming so loudly they had to bring me out of it. And then we all went out to look at the tree. It was perfectly calm weather. No wind at all. And all the other trees on the hill were undisturbed. 
just this one that fell. And what was strange about it was that it fell uphill. Did you go ahead then? No. I, I was ready to, but I thought the tree, which was a holly tree, they say that means holy in Latin. I thought that was a sign from above. Well, they didn't want me to that day. Then, then I had to move all the way across the country, here, and somehow I just never went again. But you would be willing to now. Oh, yes, particularly now. Well, while we're driving, could you tell me about your other experiences? All right. The first time it happened, I was nine years old. It was late afternoon, and I was walking on this country road with my brother and my sister. And there was a sort of blinding flash. And a man was standing in the road, wearing a black robe. He had no hair, a whitish face with big eyes, blazing red like fire. And his ears stuck out from his head. Well, we thought it was a devil. We took off running. And then suddenly it was night, even though it had been daylight just a second before. And my parents had heard the screaming, and they came racing down the road in the truck with the headlights on. And they took us home, and they got us under control. You all saw this, this person? Oh, yes. The other kids were just as scared. Well, they were littler. They, they soon forgot about it. Mm-hmm. But you didn't. Oh, no. I had to sleep with my mother for days afterwards. I used to climb trees for months then, as high as I could get. Looking up in the sky, waiting for something that never came. And you were still afraid? No, not so much afraid, just waiting. But nothing ever came. Not till years later. Long after I was married and Jim was gone. The kids were getting older. And one day I was just sitting in my office. Go ahead. Tell me about it. Suddenly, everything faded away except there was a coin in front of my eyes. Round, with a man's silhouette. Face, head and shoulders like a bust. I blinked my eyes, but it wouldn't go away, so I thought I'd been working too hard and should go home. It was dark as I was driving, and beyond the road in front of me, I could see a curve and a field, and sitting on the ground was a UFO. A force was trying to make me take that curve, but I resisted it. I kept on going towards home. <laughs> I remember thinking to myself, what's the matter with you, Lisa? You're going off the rails. I was in a kind of trance. I had power steering, but I had to slap my own face and fight to keep the car on the road. Well, at home, I was shaking so I just went straight to bed, but I couldn't sleep. I just tossed and I turned. And I looked at my watch, and it was 3 a.m., and I felt a presence in the room. There was this huge man there with red hair, and he reached out his hand to me. I thought he was going to shake hands, but instead he grabbed my left arm with his thumb on my wrist, and I writhed in pain as it burned. I know you. Others know you. Remember. You made a mark on my wrist. So the rest will know you. Always know you. And he was gone. In the morning when I woke up, I had a pain in my arm and an angry red mark like a burn there. I felt sick. I looked at my watch. It had stopped at 3 a.m. I tried to start it. It wouldn't go. I couldn't even wind the stem. I took it to my jeweler and he opened it and he couldn't believe what he saw. The whole inside of the watch was fused together, melted into one lump. I guess we're home, Lisa. Oh, yes, there, on the right. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll give you, say, uh, an hour and a half to get the kids straightened away. Then I'll come back. Turn you over to Dave, Sergeant O'Banion. But uh, when can we get together? Us? 
Well, you said you'd had your son. You're ready for hypnosis. I think it's what you need. What we both need to find out what you're all about. Well, if you put it that way, I'll, I'll take off tomorrow or as many days as you think you need. Uh, I need to know what I'm all about just as much as the rest of you. <laughs> okay, Lisa. Seat clinic. Tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. We've got a date. Dr. Dunlop. It's Dave, Bruce. Ooh, I've been waiting for this. What'd you find out? Um, uh, about the guy Terry Jessup. Forget it. We got a composite that's just that. Guy looks like anyone. Medium everything. Yeah, well, what about the landing site? What about it is right. There's a glen, a, a depression, whatever you want to call it. Like about 300 feet in diameter. Something burned off the undergrowth and some of the trees there. But was it just a plain fire or super galaxy jet exhausts? Well, whatever it was, it's just another hole in the ground now. How are you doing? Well, you, you've got to give me a chance, Dave. There's something very strange moving here. Are you comfortable, Lisa? Yes. What am I hooked up to? Oh, only supportive measures. No stimuli of any kind, no drugs. Now, you know that we're taping all you say. And that also my assistant, Gene Krebs, will make a typed transcript of it. I understand. Now, I want you to forget about me. And concentrate on the spinning disc right in front of you. All right, Doctor, I'm concentrating. There's a star at the top. A circle at the bottom. Now, watch the symbols as they turn. I, I, I can't. They go too fast. They're, they're blurring Just together. Just keep concentrating. Concentrating. Till they come together. Till the star is locked within the circle. Let them spin and meld together. Watch. Watch. Feel the spinning wheel space you out. Soothe you. Call you. Are you there? Are you there? But did you get anything? Did I get anything? Oh, it's going to knock you right off your blocks, David boy. What do you mean? With her written permission, I have it on tape. You think you're ready to take this? Shall we stop hacking around and get on with it? Okay, boy. Here it is. Everything I report here or say is of my own free will and under no coercion of any kind. Thank you, Lisa. Now, will you... Can you tell us just what happened last night? Terry was driving the car, and we saw the light go down behind the trees. He drove a little more, and then he pulled to a stop beside the road. He flickered his lights once or twice, and in a moment, two people came from the ship. Well, how did you know they were from the ship? Because they weren't human. They moved in a funny, jerky way, and they couldn't speak. Were they robots? Maybe. I, I suppose they were. We got out of the car and followed them, and there was the ship. What did it look like? It was round, very wide, sort of flat, but with a bubble top. It looked like metal. It, it appeared to be metal, a grayish type, sort of dull-looking. Did you go inside? Oh, yes. Yeah. When I first walked in, there didn't seem to be any light. It was like walking into a dark ring. But then all of a sudden, there was light. Like when I took the last step from the ramp to the hall. And it was very bright. But you couldn't see that from the outside. And inside, there didn't seem to be any light fixtures. Just lit up, all complete illumination. Bright. Blind. And then I met him. Who did you meet? This person. He looked like a man in a sort of a jumpsuit under a robe, like he used that as a sort of a coat. He was bald, and he... He spoke to me. He knew English? No. He didn't speak to me like that. He wasn't speaking with his mouth. He was speaking by um, mental telepathy. 
He said his name was Cosmos. He said that? No, he... It was like he made a picture of his name in my mind. That's the way he explained he was happy to see me, except that I had a very stubborn mind. That he had been sending me signals over and over to come to him, but that I wouldn't. And so he explained he finally had to just send for me. And now that he had you there, what were his plans for you? Well, he didn't tell me that then. He just led me about the ship. This was just a scout ship, he said. And where did it come from? From the mother ship, he said. And where was that? I don't know. Or where it came from? Oh, yes. It came from a, a star galaxy just beyond ours to the right hand of the Milky Way. And then he led me around the ship to show me that there were windows around the side, only the reflector shields were up, and that's why you couldn't see out. And then we came to this one door that was open, and we stopped. And then we went in. And in the middle of the room was this huge apparatus, and all around it, people, or these robot things, working at the panel. And there was a rail around the panel. Some strange, grinding sounds. And on each side of the apparatus is an operating table. And Cosmos led me over to one of them. Uh-oh. Well, what happened? Well, I guess the tape broke. Well, it didn't sound like this. Oh, these mechanical marvels. Forget the tape. I'll tell you the rest myself. Well, one way or another, you got me caught up with my tongue hanging out of my belt. Dave is not the only one. Perhaps you're not as intrigued. Me, I wouldn't miss the end of this for anything. Oh, all right, skeptics. I'll listen to you first. The whole subject of UFO is just another conception Barnum's gullible public likes to subscribe to. The lure of the unknown. The lodestar for suckers. Except too many scientific minds believe in the strangers from outer space. So maybe we'd better hang around and listen to Act Three. Detective Sergeant O'Banion and Dr. Bryce Dunlap have been sitting fascinated as the tape unreels an incredible story. Now, with a breakdown in the machine, they are realizing that fate has turned them into combatants, rivals for a woman they both desire. And if they could only be objective enough, a woman that both of them had probably better avoid like the plague. Can you fix the tape? I don't know. Well, okay, you said you'd tell me the rest. This, this cosmos was leading her to some kind of operating table when the tape broke. That's right. Lisa said, and I'll try to keep it as close as I can to her own words, that on one of the operating tables, a young woman was lying. I asked her what she looked like, and she said she was young, I'd say, in her 20s. She had long, long, dark, dark hair, hair and an olive complexion. Huge brown eyes. It seemed like her eyes were much larger than normal. She had on a purple gown and she was strapped to the table. Lisa, I want you to meet Amtron. Amtron. Hello, my other self. Amtron. What did she say? Pay no attention to her, Lisa. She's a very willful young lady who rebels against her destiny. What is her destiny? She has been chosen, as you have. Chosen? That's what Terry said. Just so. He is one of us. His mission was to bring you to us. But what have I been chosen for? At a later time, you will be given the seven powers. What seven powers? Those powers that will help mankind. You must go among them first and tell them that we are here at last. We? Who is we? Tell her, Andron. In the beginning, we were those who inherited the earth. My mother and father brought me from the great planet in a fleet of hundreds of spaceships. And we colonized this wilderness and made it fertile and to grow. We conquered the dry earth, built dams and libraries. Our culture flourished while you and your 
forebears ran on four feet, skulking from the sun in caves or locked in the trees by day, hunting, afraid of your shadows by night. And then came the great rain, flood, when Noah built the ark. I know nothing of your pagan legends. We had supposed all of you in the lower order had been destroyed. But what about you? I mean, I mean your people and Antron. Tell her. We took our ship, orbiting the earth till the flood subsided and the waters rolled back. Only a few of us decided to return to the earth. The rest decided to return home. To the mother planet. Why didn't you stay there? Because you needed us. You cannot control what you have. You war among yourselves, build greater and greater weapons to destroy not only you, but the green earth itself. We cannot allow that. Since we are peaceful, we must take over gradually. And to do that, some of us must sacrifice ourselves. Antron is one chosen for the sacrifice. What are you going to do to me? Do not be afraid. It is useless to struggle. Tell her. I'm wrong. They are going to make us one, sister. How? We are strapping you to the table. So you are head to head. When I turn on the machine, it is my hope that you will be fused together. Antron planted in your left side. So you carry her as the mother carries the child. Only in this case, the child will be the mother. Antron will control you so that she may guide you and bring our message to the world. So that you may be saved. Saved. Now, turn it off. Throw the switch. Let her be one of us. Dunlop. They'd punched us head to head so the machine was between us. And slowly, the table started to spin. I could hear the motor cutting on as it started whining. And the sound got higher and higher and faster and faster. And I blacked out. And when I, when I came to, the table was slowing down. I could feel it. I felt a warm sensation all about my head. It felt like something was going on inside of me, a surge of different energy. And then the machine stopped. Well, Lisa, how do you feel? I, I don't know. I, warm, relaxed, satisfied. Oh, that's wonderful. It worked, my dear. It worked. What happened to... Antron. Don't you know? She is you. A part of you. Forever. Now you are ready to spread the word. Go forth. And make the world ours. Brother. Pretty wild. Well, you don't believe any of that bunk, do you? Uh, I don't know. I've heard stranger. Oh, come on. You've got to be kidding. Well, what's the difference? It isn't anything you can use anyway. Well, I told you she's clean for all of me. i got no axes to grind. Uh-huh. Are you a sure old chum? Well, what's that supposed to mean? Would I lie to you? Uh, you might, where personal feelings were concerned. Uh, she means a lot more to both of us than that. She's not for you, Dave. Well, uh, I'll decide that. Not without some argument from me. Look, she has a couple of screwy notions. Well, that could pass. Bryce, I, I don't need any help in my personal relations. You stay away, you understand? All she needs is someone to take care of her and the kids. Once she gets the responsibilities off her head, then she'll be okay. She doesn't need any doctor messing around with her psyche. Dave, don't be a fool. You'd never understand this girl in a million years. I suppose you would. Well, what's the difference? It'll be Lisa's choice, not ours. If it comes to that. Keep the change, driver. Hiya, Bryce. Dave, what are you doing here? 
Waiting for you to get home. How was the speaking engagement? Oh, all right. I Say, how did you know I was out of town? I've been calling your house for a couple of days. I got the maid today, and she told me. You don't miss a trick, do you? <laughs> I suppose you've been making time with Lisa while I was away. Um, Bryce, swing your bag in the back of the car, will you, and climb in a minute? Say, hey, what is this, an arrest? No, I just want to talk to you. I have something to tell you. Okay, I'm listening. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm good at listening. Okay, what's on your mind? A lot. Us. I value... I value our friendship. I, I don't like to see it broken up. No, neither do I. She's gone, Bryce. Long gone. Must have been the night before last. She packed the kids and all her clothes and stuff in her car and took off. For where? Yeah. I went to the realty office where she worked. They didn't know. All they knew was she'd given notice, drawn her last pay, and cut out. She didn't leave any address? No. The only person who saw her leave was a neighbor. She headed out toward Carmel. Well, then we can trace her. Well, I don't know where that much head start. Carmel? Dave, wait a minute. That's where she saw the UFO. Yeah, or thought she did. You think maybe she... I went out to where she thought it landed. I looked it over again. Same answer. Maybe some camper started a little brush fire there. No, well, maybe not. Or a UFO took off. Well, you can believe that if you want. If it did... She went with them. The chosen one. I figured that's the way you'd believe it. Well, what about you? I can't go down that route. I think she... She just didn't want any part of us and went off about her own business. The more I thought about it, we're lucky. Lucky? Well, for one reason or another, she wasn't for either of us. Come on. I'll buy your beer and we'll toast the gal that might have been. <laughs> Wherever she is. Wherever she is. Pick your own answer. As I said in the beginning, there are really only two schools of thought about the UFO. It is or it isn't. It exists or it doesn't. You believe or you don't. So, make your choice. Let me just remind you again before you do that Lisa is an actual woman. That her report of her experiences is a documented account. I'll be back shortly. One final note on the elusive Lisa. You must realize that there are many questions unanswered about her. Did she leave this world for another on a UFO? Or is she still among us? And if she is, does she carry that strange woman from outer space implanted in her body? Is Anton now the real Lisa? Is it she who controls all her actions? Ponder a moment, my friend. And then see if you don't have the strange feeling that invades me that none of us has seen the last of Lisa. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Court Benson, and Lloyd Batista. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by x -Lite. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.